In the lexicon of forensic science, few terms have come more into the wider public consciousness than DNA evidence. DNA analysis was first put to the use of solving an open murder case in 1987, when 27-year-old Colin Pitchfork was linked to the rape and murder of two 15-year-old girls, Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth, after the DNA profile from his blood sample matched that of the semen found on the victims. Over the course of the decades that have followed, the prevalence and quality of DNA testing has steadily risen where once a blood sample the size of a quarter was needed to render a reliable profile, now remarkably scant amounts of matter can be used to confirm or exclude the culpability of an individual with increasingly staggering degrees of certainty. But in the year of 1997, the technology was not quite where it needed to be to resolve the disappearance of eight-year-old Kirsten Hatfield. On the night of May 13th, Kirsten was put to bed by her mother in their home on Jet Drive, Midwest City, Oklahoma. The next morning, she had vanished. Her bedroom window was open and small blood stains were found on the sill, as well as on the six-foot cyclone fence in the backyard, where Kirsten's torn underwear was discovered, also stained in blood. The blood samples were used to create a DNA profile, but unfortunately, no suspects at the time of the investigation were a match, and the case went cold. In addition to the devastating grief that must come with losing a child, the ambiguity around the culprit's identity would burden Kirsten's parents with yet more anguish in the form of suspicion. Due to the absence of a match from any acquaintance suspect and scepticism that a girl of Kirsten's age could have been taken in such a seemingly violent manner without making enough noise to alert anyone, suspicion that someone in her family played a role in her disappearance circulated the ranks of Oklahoma law enforcement for the nearly two decades Kirsten's case remained totally cold. Midwest City Police reopened the case in 2014 based on a tip. In the process of the new investigation, the blood samples were retested by the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to create a new and substantially more precise DNA profile. Investigators also re-interviewed multiple persons of interest that lived in the neighborhood on the night of Kirsten's disappearance. Among them was 56-year-old Anthony Joseph Palmer. Palmer lived just two doors down from the Hatfield residence. Though it wasn't known at the time of the original investigation, he also had a slew of sexual assaults in his past. Wanting to appear helpful and avoid suspicion, Palmer readily made himself available to investigators and agreed to provide them with a DNA swab without objection. The subsequent test resulted in a match with a certainty of 263 sextillion to 1. It likely goes without saying that physical evidence of this magnitude is essentially insurmountable. With the odds that the blood found on Kirsten's windowsill and on her torn underwear could belong to anyone other than Palmer being incomprehensibly minute, and an innocent explanation for Palmer's blood appearing in those places being comparably outside the realm of conceivability, one might wonder why police need to spend time on an interrogation in these sorts of cases. But aside from an outright confession making the state's job easier, the goals behind police questioning can vary beyond the most straightforward aim of securing a conviction. Due to the morbid circumstances surrounding Kirsten Hatfield's disappearance, her family had long given up on the prospect of her safe return. They had, however, longed for Kirsten to one day be afforded the dignity of a proper burial. To this end, detectives reasoned that if they could bring Palmer to terms with the severity of the evidence against him and the futility of maintaining his innocence, perhaps, even if for no other reason than selfishly attaining a small sense of redemption, he would grant the Hatfields that tiny morsel of solace. Yeah. I, I run on nicotine and caffeine. We're the, we're the same age, and uh, I tell you, any more, if I'm, I drink a lot of water. I had some stomach issues, and the doctor says drink water. It really helps with the indi uh, indigestion real bad. And it's just chewing, but I won't give it up. Uh, but if I can sleep through the night or get about four or five hours without having to get up and pee. Yeah. About six I know I know exactly, exactly what you're talking about. You know what I that's, mean? that's me. It may seem gratuitous to include the portion of this footage that simply features one of the detectives discussing his indigestion issues with the suspect. However, it is actually noteworthy. In the Reed technique, the most widely subscribed school of interrogation, investigators are encouraged to spend a portion of time building rapport with the suspect before even discussing the case at hand, let alone confronting them. It's advised that the investigator attempts to find commonalities with the suspect to instill a sense of trust. Uterol. Sulfate and something. Okay. <laughs> He's gonna be nice to you anyway. Well, I know you said no, but I always told you you'll be drinking water somebody and I'm offering. Wait and them have a little advantage over me, Tony. They've met you before. 
and I want to kind of I thank you for coming down here to talk to well us. you know and, uh, if it's, I'm, as a state employee you know it's something we have to do well we have to abide by all right. well, we appreciate law enforcement and in, all that and here's where we're kind of bad we're uh, we're still looking at the Hurston Hatfield thing and we're going back and we're talking to a lot of people and I know over the years you weren't there the first time they came down were you? you know now um, yeah. I was with Miller the, the last time the we came to talk to you about the other deal yeah. you uh, over 17 years I know in my life I've changed a lot and uh, so we wanted to talk to you about if you can kind of tell me 17 years ago how your life was, how that neighborhood was. In the lead up to this question, the detective is attempting to lay some potential minimizations of Palmer's crime. 17 years is a long time. I know I've changed a lot over that time. The idea being, when it comes time to go for a confession, Palmer might feel as if he has permission to partially excuse his actions. I was a different person then. It may be slightly too soon to even allude to Palmer's potential culpability. In the early stages of an interrogation, the usual protocol is to take more of an information gathering approach, establishing the suspect's baseline of behavior behavior for comparison later on. Still, it will be some time before the first direct confrontation and Palmer certainly begins becoming more talkative. What was going on in that neighborhood? I know I've talked, I've read some of the reports that uh, from the interviews before and how it appears to me that you, they call you Uncle Tony around there because you care about the kids. You well, the kids, yeah. Yeah. basically when I moved nature. there, lived there, there was a bunch of older people. That was like an, I don't know, not a no retirement place, but most of the people in that area were old retirees. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, being, I like doing stuff all the time. You know, I was always outside and if somebody's working on their vehicle, got to go be busy body, hey, you know, and help them. Or somebody's washing machine was broke down and older people, you know, they can't, Nights, older people, <laughs> you know, can't do stuff. And I've always been mechanically inclined, you know, where I could figure stuff out, you know, right. or help them move this, or you know, just I've always been, I don't know about friendly, but neighborly. Right. Mm -hmm. And that being my first home, right. you know, I tried to make it where that neighborhood was my home. Yeah. Well, did you help any of the kids over there? Well, well, when the feed them pizza, yeah, I've stuff. always there's always that's you my Kool Aid pet. house. Well, I don't know about Kool Aid. That's yeah. always been my pet peeve. Is I grew up hungry, you know, and I don't. There's a lot of kids hungry, yeah. you know, and I I, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, not where I'd go down my way. Hey, you hungry? But I mean, you see kids, you're over there eating something, and they're just right. You know, you see them draw. I can't stand that. Yeah. As my partner uh, Lander said, um, we're still working on the Hatfield case. Okay. And there's some things that uh, we want to go back over with you. Um, we try to be as thorough as we can be on cases like this. And um, I'd like to go back initially over some of what you've already talked to okay. uh, Detective Miller about in the past. I wasn't there. I'm kind of up to speed on some of it, but um, my understanding is, is when Kirsten um, disappeared, you were still living there yes. at 1104, correct? Okay. Do you mind just initially kind of take us back to 1997 and go back over that, maybe that evening before and into that morning when all of it all kind of start blowing up and just best you can tell us everything you remember <coughs> and, t and take your time I know we're going back some some years yeah here. I know starting to get that old timer stuff but really the only thing I can really remember is afterwards you know when you know because it, it was just a, a typical day you remember anything unusual about that evening that stands out to you? 
No, other than what I told them about, you know, seeing the white truck, you know, in front of their, the white Chevy truck in front of their yard. Okay. You know, I, I like I said, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with those people. Didn't know them at all. You know, okay. it's not like I went, hey, yeah, you, you got your little girls? No, it wasn't nothing like that. Okay. I was usually I was outside working on my yard. You know, either talk to the neighbors or kid would come by, Tony, can you fix my bike? You know, stuff like that. You said you didn't know. Um, them, I'm assuming you're meaning Shannon and yeah. Thurston. Yeah. Or and I couldn't even tell you how long they they lived there. Okay. I was going to actually ask you that. Um, so you didn't know how long they'd been living there when this happened. And they, I, going to think they hadn't been there very long. And and tell me what you remember about that. Do you remember seeing them move in or anything? No. No. I'm trying to remember. I. There were a friend of mine lived in that house. Uh, well, I can't remember what his damn name is, but he had a uh, janitorial service, mm -hmm. Janny King, mm -hmm. and I visit with him. I helped him put the fence up around his house. Had you ever been inside that house when that gentleman lived there, William? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm assuming you probably saw Shannon and Kirsten running around the neighborhood and so forth. To tell you the truth, until that happened, I, I, I think I seen the kid one time. She was playing with uh, uh, Crystal that lived up the street, but I don't remember if it was in that time frame or what. I don't, I don't really know because I, like I said, I didn't pay no attention. If Palmer's innocence in this case was in any way possible, then the most suspicious behaviour from these last several minutes would be his consistent effort to distance himself from the Hatfield family as much as possible. He had a reputation as being a friendly neighbour, eager to help with repair jobs and who would sometimes give food to hungry children. There's nothing inherently sinister about any of this, in fact, quite the opposite, and having these traits would never make you the prime suspect in a child abduction absent any other evidence. But Palmer is adamant not just that he didn't have a close relationship with the Hatfields, but that he was barely aware of their existence, despite his neighborly reputation. Okay. Do you remember ever, like, giving food to Kirsten, no, or no. talking to Kirsten? No. Was she ever at your house? No. Anything like no. that? Again, just imagine you were innocent of any wrongdoing, and you were asked if you had given food to a child. Would your reaction be this strong? Firm, forthright denials can actually be a good indicator of innocence, but they're expected in response to accusations, rather than innocuous questions. So there was never any time no. that Shannon asked for your help to no. fix this or that, or mow the yard for me, or... Okay. Just tell you the truth, you know, the only good, and I didn't even recognize her when y'all showed me the pictures of her. Mm -hmm. That was the only time I could actually say, okay, that's, you know. I met her once afterwards. She was going up and down the street, and, you know, she was still looking for her kid, and, you know, I met her once. So I gave her some money so she'd have gas money so she could keep doing what she was doing, you know. Was this like in the day, days after, or? Yeah, talking days about? after. Let, let me bounce back a little bit. We got off a little bit off track. Um, I was kind of having you go back over what you remembered through the night, uh, and I, I read over the the FBI notes that they took when they talked to you. I guess there was some information about you hearing dogs barking. Yeah, I had a dog in the backyard. Dog, his name was Dog. About three or four o'clock in the morning, he went to raising hell. So I just, you know, really. Believe it or not, in my neighborhood, we still got skunks and possums and stuff like that, plus other dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why that woke me up, but because I usually didn't wake up, and and usually he's out inside anyway. But it woke me up, and he was barking at that back fence, at our back fence. But at the time, as you walk out my back door, I had an old apricot tree. So unless you went, went out there, you know, you couldn't see. And I just hollered at him because you know, thinking it was another dog, because there was always, and traffic, there was human traffic back there, but usually yeah, there was other dogs, about. yeah. There was other dogs or cats, and there was always animals through there, so I just, you know, I really didn't think nothing about it. I just hollered at him, and he came in, and I went back to bed. So you actually let him back into the yeah. house? Yeah. So you opened, what, your back door, I'm assuming, and let him in? Yeah. Did you go investigate? No. Did you look down the alley? No. Anything like that? 
No, because usually in the past, whenever I did, that's what it was, was, you know, either another dog or people use that alleyway, you know, to get through. Why, I don't know, because, I mean, I don't know where you'd be going other than from house to house, but there was always, not always, but there was there was traffic. Okay. Um, and, and speaking of the alleyway, did you have any kind of a gate or anything that went out to it? So you didn't have access to it through your backyard? No. I, I mean, I, I think that would be, be ideal to be able to go out in the alley and you could back a trailer up and it just seems like everybody had a gate. Well, the house next door to me had didn't have a fence. So whenever I weed eat it or, you know, did whatever, because I always weed eat it, you know, two foot around from my fence, you know, next door and then that alleyway, which the alleyway was... Because I read your your uh, statement, you said you saw your gate ajar. What gate was that? Gate ajar. Yeah. You didn't have a gate on the back no. or on the side? Did you have a gate on the side of the house? Yeah, we got a gate. Well, it's... Yeah, it's a gate, but no, it wasn't on the door. Okay. It, it, anything else that night after you let dog back in, did anything else occur that you remember? No, I went back to bed being dog. Okay. And then when did you first become aware of uh, Kirsten was missing and all that was going on? Well, the next day there was all that activity and I asked neighbor across the street what was going on they said they couldn't find Kirsten and I didn't think nothing about it you know mm -hmm. I went to work and then I, I don't remember if she called me or I called over there or what and they said they just want people back you know because they wanted to go to our houses and blah 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 so somebody had called me said they was they was they, that we were wanted back at our house okay so I, I came home okay and then what happened no, I just sat there did did any yeah. of our officers or the FBI or anybody come by? It was an FBI, you know. Okay. We came in, took statements, you know, walked through the house and, you know, wanted to go in the backyard and, you know, because I had a shed back there. He wanted to look in the shed and... Okay. So he did look through the house and yeah. look through the shed? This is almost certainly a lie. In an earlier interview, Palmer had told Detective Daryl Miller that an FBI agent had searched his house the day after Kirsten's disappearance. When Miller went to verify this, he found no records confirming any kind of police search on Palmer's house in 1997. You probably don't remember who that was, I'm sure. No. Okay. And did he, was he just asking you general questions about Kirsten and did you know her, have you seen her, that kind of thing, or? Basically. Did you write out a statement for him, or did he no, really just have a conversation? I thought he wrote out a statement. Okay. Did they drug test back back in them days? At your work? Well, uh, they always hung that over on us, you know. But we never, we never had to got you a. Okay. So it was kind of the the threat. Yeah. There were some of us they would have. Have you ever had any trouble with the law on you? Oh, yeah. Before? Uh, years ago, first degree burglary and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. I think I told your partner that. Really? Back when I was a dumb kid. How, how long ago was that? I was, I think, fixed to turn 18. Oh, so you were just a boy. Yeah. Okay. And all about a, my girlfriend. Where was that a, at? A, uh, Walters, Walters, Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Up in Cotton County. Yep. In the last 17 years, Tony, have you have you uh, changed much? Here, the narrative of past regret that we saw a quick preview of at the beginning of this interrogation begins in earnest. This is a form of the minimization technique, where the interrogator will try to downplay the severity of the suspect's crime. Although neither detective has directly accused Palmer of any crime at this point, they'll know he's certainly anticipating it. Their strategy is to give him time to come to terms with his actions through the prism of having done it as a former self, a different man than stands before them today, a sort of redemption by way of regret. Is this how you were 17 years ago? Just a hard working man? Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay. I've changed older wise, but no. And yeah, I'm not the same person I was 17 years ago. I've matured a little bit. And I, wish, I wish I could say that. Life changes people, you know. As you get older, you start recognizing things that you've 
that you could handle differently than what you if you had it to do over again you'd change you know I can yeah, but say that's that. the thing we can't we can't ever change it yeah. no you can't change what, what happened but sometimes you can make things better I remember a few years ago I went to my high school reunion and I seen a kid that Honestly, I just him in into death. The detective now goes into an anecdote about making amends with a man he bullied as a teenager, and Palmer remains relatively reluctant to engage with the regret narrative, just letting the detective tell his story. This is fairly predictable as he knows what he's done and why he's here. It's a rather tedious portion of the footage to watch, which is why we're fording through it. But do note that what they're doing here isn't as meandering and pointless as it may seem on the surface. The interrogation itself hasn't begun yet, and the detective won't have any expectation that Palmer will confess to the murder of Kirsten Hatfield just because he's fessed up to being a bully in high school. All he's attempting to do is provide as much psychological cushioning as he can for Palmer's self-concept so that he might be more receptive to minimizations when his undeniable culpability in this crime is laid before him later on. He's just again establishing that your past doesn't define your present. He still picks on me though, so he really hasn't changed his ways. He was a bully, always a bully. Mm -hmm. But he, he, uh... Like he asked for it. <laughs> next week he's gone fishing. The week before he was gone fishing. You get to go fishing? Yeah. For a week? Yeah. Don't don't I call it vacation you. because he like because when he's gone I <laughs> do whatever. <laughs> it, 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 it's all right. It's my therapy. It's all right. Yeah, uh, actually it is therapy. It's very good therapy. It is. I'm like you. I work. I mean that's all I ever known was to work. But now my wife doesn't understand that working is therapy too. Well, I've always I've always suffered from depression back when I was a young kid. So, and that always seems like working, I guess, gets your mind off of whatever it is you're thinking about or, you know, whatever. So, that's all I do is work. It gives you a sense of accomplishment, too. That's one thing we really... Well, especially when your, your, your folks tell you that you ain't worth a shit and you'll never amount to hell of beans and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I know. My only... Well, the only thing that really, and that's you're probably, probably getting completely off the deal, but when I left Walters, when I got in trouble with Walters, I was going out with an angel. I mean, a good woman, huh? My biggest mistake. The first time Palmer engages with the narrative of past regrets, he states that the biggest mistake of his life was ruining the relationship he was in when he was 18 years old as a result of his conviction. The sly implication being that anyone guilty of child murder would not have the former as their number one. Yeah, I fucked up big time. Did you? That's the only time I can really say that I fucked up. Lose your temper. Well, yeah, that's basically what it would have happened. You know, he was picking on her, and I had, like a dumb kid, had to go do something about it, you know. Palmer appears to be attributing the motive behind his assault and battery charge in Walters, Oklahoma, to avenging his then girlfriend's mistreatment by another man. The victim of the assault in question was his landlord at the time, a woman who would later testify at his trial that he was attempting to beat her unconscious with a soda bottle and rape her. Her teenage son was able to intervene and stop the attack. Not necessarily a dumb kid. Sometimes men got to do. Well, it. now you know there's other ways of doing yeah. stuff, but and of course I've been drinking. It's not the best uh, decision making no. across conducive to great decision making. Hey, to, to get back to what we're here about, I'm not, I mean, you've been living there all these years since Kirsten went missing. Um, I, I'm curious about your your thoughts on what happened, who might be involved, that kind of thing. I don't know, to tell you the truth. Like I said, I didn't know him. But the one thing that's always bothered me, that she left, the mom, mm -hmm. she went to Jones, I guess, with her dad or something like that. I, you couldn't have got me off out of my house. I mean, I know, what if she comes back or, you know, what if somebody makes a call or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. I, there was no way I'd left that house. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that bothers me. Yeah. So you felt like she shouldn't have left, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever at any point over these years or, or back when it occurred um, have any knowledge of what happened or know no. who was involved? No. Were you in any way involved? No. no. So you're not responsible no. for Kirsten's disappearance? No.
didn't play any part in that. No. Like I said, didn't know him. Didn't have, like I said, I just barely, you know, seen, might have seen her once, twice, mm -hmm. playing with the kids, but other than that, I didn't, I didn't know him. What, just out of curiosity, what do you think the motivation was of whoever did this? I mean, why would this have happened? Well, now? Dan, I couldn't have told you, but after over the years, you know, and hearing the rumors and this and that and the other, it, me, it always boils down to drugs. You know, I heard that she was on meth and cocaine and all this other stuff. And Don's wife was the same thing. You know, she said, yeah, she had been over there, you know, that night and they got lit up. So apparently she did get lit up because, you know, if somebody did come in, mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you have heard it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So but I know that mean that she left Kirsten home alone, you think? Or? No, I don't know. I'm sure she did. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know. And I really didn't pay much attention to, to Don and his wife. It's just, uh, uh, I, Where did they live? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Caddy all this. me. Straight across the house. street? Not straight, just Caddy Corner. A little White House, Caddy Corner for me. Okay. And they had two or three kids. And I'd come home one day, I re was rewarding myself. I did something and I was stopped at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Got me a family pack of chicken. I was going to go down. And the kids, whenever I walked up, they were just, the way they were eyeballing me, you know, like they hadn't ate nothing. I mean, they were really, if you'd have, if you'd have seen them, you'd have thought that too, because I mean, they were skinny. So I got me a piece of chicken, I was chewing on it, and they just, you want some chicken? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that all right that they can have this? Yeah. So I, I just gave them the whole damn thing. From looking back over the history, I, I understood that uh, Shannon's brother, I guess stayed with you for Aaron, a short Aaron. time. Aaron, Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. Tell us about that. How did that happen? And <coughs> he was in the neighborhood, you know, he's looking, apparently looking for, you know, his niece. Mm -hmm. So I'm out there one day and he stops and he talks, you know anything, blah, 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 you know, and we just got to talking and, you know, he's living in a damn, you know, under a bridge and dude, you know, I found out already that he, that night, that he'd been locked up, you know, so he wasn't a suspect in my books. Now, did you know Aaron at all before? No. So you'd never met him, never talked to him no. before, either? No. Did he ever confide in you anything about um, the case or anything about Just Shannon? Just he couldn't, he couldn't clear his sister. Those words will always, you know, I can't, that's the way he said it. Mm -hmm. I can't clear my sister. So he was suspicious of, of Shannon, huh? Did he ever give you any any real factual information that would be beneficial to the case? No, I'm I, like I said, I'm here on my own free will. If I had any information, yeah, I'd give it to you. Because that'd be the same thing if something were to happen to my daughter. My God, yeah. Um. We've talked a lot about kind of the background. I, I want to kind of talk to you about um, some new information developed in this case, okay? Um, as you know, Detective Miller got some buckle swabs from you yeah. uh, a couple months back or whenever it was. There was a reason for that, okay? Um, and we collected DNA samples from lots of people. But we had submitted, resubmitted some evidence from the case and uh, got a DNA hit, okay? okay. Um, the reason those buckle swabs were being collected was we were trying to find the person yeah. responsible. Okay. We we talked about had you ever been in the backyard, have you ever been in the house, all those things, and you said you hadn't. No, no while they were there, no. Okay. Well, Sometimes, when a person is experiencing profound anxiety, they will release a small amount of gas from their upper digestive tract. If you pay very close attention in the seconds to come, you might be able to catch Palmer exhibiting this symptom when he is faced with the first direct confrontation. I don't, I don't believe you. Oh. Tony, I don't think you're telling the whole truth, okay? Your DNA is in the backyard the morning that she was discovered missing, okay? and on her window, and on the panties she'd been wearing the night before that were recovered in the backyard. No. 
No, not me, because I was not, no. Denial in the face of such staggering evidence may seem farcical, but from a standpoint of pure self-preservation, this is actually the correct move from where Palmer is sitting at this moment. In the United States, investigators are permitted to lie to suspects about the evidence they have against them. It's a source of much controversy, but is not a factor in play here. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's the truth. I find it far-fetched, but no. Because I, I don't know, I didn't know him. Maybe you didn't know him, Tony. But we need And to I didn't know. have no business over there at all. That may be also. What we need to talk about is what you were doing in that backyard that night and what happened. We need to get to the truth of I what have happened. no idea what you're talking about. Were you there trying to help Kirsten? No. Like I said, I didn't know anything about them people at all. Nothing. Nothing. Well, never met him. Never said hi, bye, nothing. Well, here's the here's our problem with that is how did your DNA get there? Then? You're gonna have to explain this. Right if you were there, how I do it? If you were there, <coughs> if you were there because you heard her yelling for help from your backyard, and you go over there to see because you knew that she, her mother was a meth head and that she is probably at home alone and you went over there to help no. and you went to the backyard to avoid a conflict with the mother and you were just going to take care of this no. little girl because just like you growing up you didn't want her being treated that way that's, that's, that's how understandable things become. The detective should be applauded for his vivid imagination in crafting the scenario. This is an alternative question. Investigators will routinely offer a more palatable scenario for how a crime may have come to transpire, as people find it much easier psychologically to admit guilt if the admission is coupled with morally justifiable conditions. This isn't just because such conditions might lead the suspect to believe they'll be met with more leniency in the courts, but also because it preserves the quality of their self-concept and the way they think they'll be perceived by others. The approach will not prove to be effective on Palmer, and this is understandable. There is nothing in the scenario he's being presented with that would explain his blood's presence on Kirsten's underwear, and he is rightly calculating that there is no circumstance that would lend moral justification to the abduction, presumably rape, and murder of an eight-year-old girl. Yeah, I could understand that, but I don't, I don't understand how you get you my DNA. Maybe, well, how, exactly, how is our, your blood? No. I have no idea. Well, I'm not I wasn't there. there at all. We we weren't there either. All we have is this, the evidence that was collected. Mm -hmm. I didn't collect it. It was collected 17 years ago, Tony. But it's there. And we have to deal with this. And you're saying you were never there. No. There's no reason it was, should be there. No. It's not helping your cause. What's going to help your cause is to explain to us how it's there. I because the don't have a clue. Your blood is in that backyard the morning that she's discovered missing. Okay, this is your chance, Tony. I understand to that. To explain, but explain what that. happened. Maybe you didn't mean no for whatever I happened to happen. There, you, you were there. You were there. Was you in a depression? Was that a, t a period when you were going through a depression? and drinking and getting depressed and you don't remember until later what no. actually occurred? I don't even think I was drinking that night. To tell you the truth, I might have been, but I don't think so. And I was in bed. And so I'm pretty sure deal, I don't sleep well. This isn't a deal where you got drunk the night before and and actually went through with some urges you had? No. Whether you're Attracted to little girls no. or whatever your I've thing never been be. attracted to little girls or little boys. Well, once again, how is your blood there? No, I don't know. Do well, you not do you not believe me when I tell you that we have your DNA? No, I you? don't. You don't believe me? This is our OSBI results. I, I kind of um, no disrespect, I get the impression maybe you don't believe me when I told you what I told you. So I want to just bring you the copy directly from OSBI and we've highlighted it here for you. Okay? I 
I just want you to understand that this isn't this isn't a bluff, Tony. You see those odds? Those odds, um, I can just tell you from my years of experience, I've never seen at that level, which means this is your DNA. Okay, this is your I blood, Tony. Okay. Don't know. Here is, um, that's Kirsten's panties that her mom identified that she had on that night. And that's where your blood was found as well as on her window seal. So this isn't just a, and, and just so you'll know, we also located some blood on the fence picket and it's still out for testing, but I suspect that there's a good chance that get, that'll come back to you. I can't explain that. Tell us, I mean, tell me what happened. How did you get injured? I'm trying to figure it out myself, what, what, what all this is about. I mean, you were, you were in, in some way injured for your blood to be on her window and for your blood to be in her panties. My, what I want to know from you, was there some kind of a dispute between you and Kirsten? I had no dealings with those people, didn't know nothing about them. I believe at that. All. I believe that. But I also believe that this is your DNA on her window seal and your DNA on her panties in the backyard. Let me ask you this. Your wife told us that every year on Kirsten's anniversary that you're upset about it, that you go through a phase of being depressed and upset about it. And the reason that is, it's on the news and yeah, how do you feel about it? Well, yeah, I'm going to be upset. I mean, it's a missing child. Duh. If you want to carry it to your grave and not do what's right, that's on you. But you need to think about what you're doing because right now, these you decisions think you're about making. How is my damn blood or me? Because I was not there. And I know in that night I was in my same mind. Did I read that the other day? I don't understand it. Well, it's pretty clear. Yeah. You know how big sex thing it is? No such thing. Huh? <coughs> no such thing. Yeah, it is too big. I mean, that's, you can line people up from planet Earth all the way to the moon. You remember me, don't you? I mean, we, I've been working on this case for two years. Here, look at me real quick. I've been working on this for two years. I've got a little girl that about her age, Kirsten's yep. age at the time. And this case is all I think. This case has taken over me. And it, I can imagine. It, it, it's all I think about, you know. And I told you earlier on, you know, all the cases I work is crimes against children cases. So my whole life, I go home, I have kids. I come to work, I deal with kids, you know. And you seem like, like, like you said in our past, you know, conversations we've had. All you do is you care about kids. You take care of the neighborhood kids, and you got a heart just like me. That. Yeah, and that, that's what I we're, we're trying to figure out, Tony is. How is your your blood, your DNA, get on it? And you were there when I when I took your sample from you, right? We had an unknown male profile DNA on her panties and on her windowsill. You yeah, don't make them sense to me. All I'm concerned about is where she at, Tony. I'm not sure. Where she at? Help me find her. I mean, we got pictures of window sills and 
the windowsill that day, you know, we go right down the line with all these pictures, you know, you say, oh, I mean, everything, of course, today, it's a totally different ballgame. There'd be 500 pictures of the windowsill. And it, it's all there. I mean... Did you figure out the, the prints? Yeah, those are kids' prints there. I was not there the day before, that day, next day. I know. But we need to figure this out. Yeah, you do. But you're, you're my key. You're a little one that can help me, Tony. I want you to help me. If I could, I would, because it's making me look real bad. Well, yeah. Well, I'm not going to hear, I'm not going to you. I'm not going to be mean or anything, but I, I, I need the truth. I, need I to, understand. I, I, need I, to, I need the truth, too. I need to find her. I need to find Kirsten. Help me find her. I can't help you. Was there somebody else involved? I can't help you on that either. I No, I didn't help anybody or help myself take this girl. And how do you explain the ball? I don't. Well, I can't. You got a, let me see your arm. You have a scar on your arm. What happened there? I was picking up a toilet bowl and it cracked. When was that? Last year. Hey, hey, I'm in the room. I'm Major David Huff. Hi. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, I'm pretty much these guys' boss. Um, the guys have been out there kind of talking to me about the interview. Um, what do you say? Let's, let's take a break for just a minute. I don't want you getting upset at us. We really are trying to get to the truth, but I don't want you getting upset with us. If you take a drink of water, we'll just relax for a minute, okay? And um, we'll just take a deep breath. All right. I, kn I know. Last night, smoke a cigarette. Yeah, come on, come on out with us. You're gonna have to go with us, though, okay? Okay. Yeah, I understand. Pausing an interrogation at this point is a rare move. The standard practice is to keep pressure on until the suspect offers something investigators can work with, embracing the alternative question, for instance, or even merely walking back the extent of previous assertions. In this instance, however, Major Huff's decision to break from protocol is understandable. The interrogation has now been going on for over an hour. The detectives have put their best evidence in front of Palmer and continuously emphasized its magnitude, but Palmer has stubbornly maintained his innocence. If the only goal was securing a conviction they would have most likely charged him and let the evidence speak for itself in court at this point, but they are genuinely determined to recover Kirsten's remains. Their wager is if they afford Palmer some time to relax as much as possible, then perhaps he will be able to better process the circumstances, reconcile to his fate, and try to win as much favour as he can by giving them the information they need. I, don't, I, can't, I can't explain this. And the only thing that I'm thinking right now is, yeah, I'm being set up because we want to close this case. That's the only thing that's coming in my head right now. Seriously. Okay. Well, um, I understand what you're saying. I'm going to be honest with you. When this first stuff, the stuff first came out, um, the DNA, I, I want you to understand how it works because not everybody does this, so it wouldn't be uncommon for you not to know. Uh, the normal person that doesn't do police work doesn't know. The DNA that we got off of these panties, that was taken all the way back when it happened, okay? And it was put into a container where we could keep it indefinitely, all right? 
and it's been there ever since. The FBI ticket, um, when they were helping us, it was there, okay? We had what was called an unknown DNA sample. We knew that it was human DNA, we can tell that. Astra. Oh, yeah, right. We knew that it was human DNA, okay? Um, and we knew it was human DNA from a male. We can know that. What we don't know, when we got it back then, we didn't know the name attached to it. We didn't know whose DNA that was, okay? When the FBI and Detective Miller went out and got those swabs, okay, got them, they got them from a bunch of people, all right? You being one of them. Then it was tested against a sample that was taken off the windowsill and off of the panties, which by the way, I don't know if they told you this or not, but also has Kirsten's DNA on it. Because little kids, they do a little pee pee in their pants and skid marks. So her DNA's on it, your DNA's on it, and it's also on the windowsill. That was all done way back when this all happened. It's just now that the DNA um, results have come back. And I don't know if they told you this, you seem like an intelligent man, so to help you comprehend what we're talking about when we say we know this to be a fact, the number sextillion, what this is saying, if you take a one and you put 21 zeros behind it, yeah, it's, it's, it's yours. Um, <coughs> any anybody in the world, any scientist is going to say that that is your blood. Now, obviously, when we have a case like this, we're not going to, Mr. Palmer, we're not going to lay out everything that we know and everything we have. Um, that's just not the way it works. It'd be counterproductive. Um, we're not going to do it. There's more than this, but we want to try to get you to digest, kind of digest one thing at a time. Now, having said that, um, do we know all the circumstances surrounding what happened that night? We don't. Um, only, only God, the person who did it, and Kirsten probably know that. But I'm going to tell you this: we do know that Kirsten was wearing those that night. We do know that your blood's on there and her DNA is on there. And that is just an absolute fact. Right. Yeah, I understand that. This is what I think. I think that you're not an evil person. I don't think you're an evil person. I've heard about your work history. Uh, you know, I know all that stuff. I know you're a dependable person, a hardworking man. I think on this one night, this one time, for whatever reason, that some demon inside you, you made a mistake. The, the, fact, is, the fact is there. Here, here's what, here's what, how we look at it. You know, I'm about to retire. Um, you know, I, I know he told you he's got a young daughter. We want to, we want to know where this baby's at. We want to know where I'm she's at. Sure. No, I can't help you. I don't understand any of this. Tony, I, we need your help. You have another one? Mm -hmm. I do. I smoke three packs a day. More fortunately for me. I, 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 if I could help you, I would help you. Well, but I don't like sitting in this situation. I don't, I don't like this. This don't look good at it for me at all. No. And I've, I've done research on you know what happened at, when you was in Walters and stuff like that. And I've, I've listened to part of the interview you know, here this morning. And... Is there a chance that maybe you blacked out and did it? That you went over and did something? 
You said you said something about you don't think you sleepwalk. No. I'm just going through scenarios. Okay. I mean, and that was kind of being sarcastic. Well, <coughs> Texas Middle brings up a good point. I mean, um, from what we've read from the report that happened there in Walters, um, that was a pretty horrific deal that happened. Yep. And it kind of shows that it's somebody that can lose it. Yeah, I was for a whatever. stupid kid that was drunk. And I still pay for that. That'll never go away. Well, what it, what it comes down to is this, you know, we've had a lot of people in this room and interviewed a lot of people about stuff similar to this, unfortunately, and there's two kinds of people we deal with. There's the people that when we prevent, pre present the evidence that we got and they know they've been um, found out, um, they stand up and take some type of responsibility and move on uh, or they deny it and to me um, that's the folks that are really evil and I just d didn't get the feeling that that was you but I guess I could be wrong it wouldn't be the first time I don't I can't I can't explain it And I'm still sitting here thinking, April's full, y'all come up with April full. Because that's... No, I don't know if I'm something this serious. No, there's no, there's no April full. Where, where, where do you think, if, if someone was to, if someone, the person that did do this, where would they take her and dump her at? In a last-ditch effort to find Kirsten's remains, Detective Miller tries to elicit a confession by way of a third-person account. You may not have done it, but where do you think the person who did would have dumped the body? It's a long shot to be sure, but not an approach without any precedent of success. Prolific serial killer Ted Bundy, for instance, first began divulging details of his crime speaking in the third person, at length, while still maintaining his innocence. Sure, they would. Couldn't tell you. I mean, I watch all the cop shows and stuff like that, or what I do watch, and there's, there's no telling. People change, Tony. People change. You talk about your home life and how you grew up. I grew up with a single mom that raised nine kids by herself, and I'm about the only one out. Of, I'm about the only one out of my family that that's graduated school, that has a successful job. Oh, I, you know, people tell me you can't do that. You're a piece of crap. Yeah, and I showed them that. No, that right. It's not about anything like that. I was not sexually molested or abused. I was hated, but I found good in this. You know, he taught me some shit, and that's helped me, you know, go through my life. I know some stuff. I know carpentry, I know mechanics, you know. Okay. I cuss him to, to this day because he hated me, yeah. but... Jack of all trades. That didn't, that didn't turn me into a monster. And I, I, I was hated. Yeah, and I, I don't think you're a monster. I think this is just one time something happened and it went a little too far and something had to, you know. Something went a little too far. This might perfectly encapsulate why all four investigators and their varied range of strategies have been utterly fruitless throughout this interrogation. If the death of an eight-year-old who you had no prior connection to was the result of something going a little too far, then what exactly was that something? Child murder is widely and rightly regarded as one of the most heinous crimes a human being can commit, made worse only if said murder is sexually motivated, and one of the most fundamental cornerstones of obtaining a confession is being able to lead a subject to believe that if they own the identity of a person who has committed the act in question, then they don't have to simultaneously relinquish their current identity of being a good person, or at least not a fundamentally terrible one. The investigators have utilized minimizations, alternative questions, rapport building, and feigned understanding. They've put the pressure on, 
they've taken the pressure off. They've appealed to Palmer's hope of redemption and they've stressed his situation's futility, all to no avail. Perhaps one or more of these approaches may have worked if Palmer stood accused of some sort of crime of passion. If he had murdered his spouse, for instance, then maybe he could have been talked into believing that if he embraced a particular version of events, he could hold on to the self-image of something short of a monster. That's something we'll never know. What we do know, and what the investigators are soon going to finally resign themselves to, is that there's no version of events or hypothetical motivations that will let Anthony Palmer give himself permission to own this particular crime. No matter how objectively, astronomically ironclad the evidence is that he's guilty of it, he is not capable of crossing that last psychological barrier of owning that and accepting what that says about him. Hey, uh, do you want to take a break, and give him some time to think about what we talked about? Do, do you have any more, do you have any more sh to smoke? No, I'm good. Well, go ahead, go ahead and smoke for a minute. Let us go out here and talk, Once you get your head together. We'll give you one more opportunity to, to think about what I just said, okay? you're going to spend in jail. Just because we don't have a body doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to charge you with anything. I I've got that. enough evidence against you. But, no. go ahead. Tony, Sorry. there's there's an arrest warrant in that deal signed by a judge and it's for murder. And judges don't sign that unless there's probable cause. And to be fair to you, okay, to be fair to you, um, you're not going anywhere. You're you're being charged with murder, and here's the deal. I want you to remember. Um, right now, we're interviewing every one of your family members. You can probably hear it in the next room. We're already at your house. We will have back hose, ground penetrating sonar, cadaver dogs, the whole nine yards. Oh. We was laughing about that yesterday. What's so funny about that? that if y'all were to ever go in our backyard, well, I've got dogs and cats and pets everywhere in that backyard. <coughs> I don't know what the hell we was laughing about that. We was watching something on TV. Like where you bury them? Or animals, yeah. Well, well so we're well, not going to find, and, and this is your opportunity because, I mean. You ain't going to find Kirsten Hatfield in my backyard. Or on your property anywhere. No. Where do I find her? I don't know. Did you black out and you took her somewhere and dumped her? I didn't get her. Who did? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to leave it with, um, you're that person that has no remorse, and that's the way the report's going to read. Yeah. Because what I'm seeing from you is you could care less if we ever find her. And yeah, I did. You okay. could care less. Just put a cigarette out for me. Turn around for me. Put your hand behind your back. Relax. You're under arrest for murder, kidnap, Kirsten Hatfield.
Anthony Palma did not show much emotion this afternoon as that guilty verdict was read. This verdict comes more than two decades after Kirsten Hatfield went missing from her Midwest City home on May 14, 1997. Hatfield's body has never been found, but the prosecution argued Palma abducted and murdered the little girl. A key piece of evidence throughout this trial was a pair of Kirsten's panties found in the family's backyard. Those panties and the windowsill on the girl's bedroom had blood on them and the DNA was a match to Palma. When the verdict was read, Kirsten's mother Shannon and her sister's faith broke down in tears and they spoke with us just minutes after Palma was led away. I, I can't explain it, but we are just floored by this miracle and we are so thankful it puts our hope back into the criminal justice system. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, everybody here. Now, Palma will be back again in court here sometime next month to learn his sentence. The man who murdered an eight-year-old child two decades ago will serve life in prison for her death. Anthony Palma surprised the court when he waived his right to appeal his conviction. Kirsten Hatfield's family tells News 9 crime tracker Jennifer Pierce there's still one mystery that needs to be solved. Jen? That's right, Bobby. Kirsten Hatfield's family was not only shocked, but relieved when Anthony Palma waived his appeal rights. They think it's only a matter of time before he reveals where he buried their little girl 20 years ago. 58-year-old Anthony Palma made his final court appearance. He listened as the judge told him he will serve life in prison without the possibility of parole. Palma also waived his right to appeal his conviction. Prosecutors say it's an unusual move. For what it's worth, I appreciate him doing that because this gives some finality to the family. Uh, don't use the word closure because there's no such thing as closure. They still walked out of these doors with some questions that need to be answered. A question only this convicted murderer can answer. They want to know where eight-year-old Kirsten Hatfield's body is buried. She disappeared from her Midwest City home 20 years ago. Hatfield's sister and mother looked Palma in the eye in court as they read victim testimonies. They both told Palma they forgive him, but want him to lead authorities to their loved one's body. Obviously, we've been praying for years, but we've been writing prayers down, and we hope that he's able to get them at some point and read them, but um, just just so he can see how serious we are. Palma remained quiet as he was led back to jail. He will be transferred to DOC custody and live the remainder of his life in prison. I hope that uh, mm -hmm. that will bring him to a place of telling us so we can lay her to rest. On January 11th of 2019, Anthony Joseph Palmer was found strangled to death in his prison cell, only 13 months into his sentence at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. His cellmate, Raymond Pilato, also serving a life sentence for murder charges, was found to be responsible for Palmer's death. The motivation for the killing was deemed to be retributive, as baby killers have never been smiled upon in prison. His slaying could be perceived as a piece of morbid karma, but tragically, it served as one last devastation for the Hatfield family. Palmer died before he was ever able to come around to disclosing where and how he disposed of Kirsten's body, and to this day her remains have never been found.